All right, well, we can get started and let people continue to join as we go, but uh, thanks so much for joining us on this absolutely gorgeous day if you're in West Michigan. I know it's probably a hard decision to get on a webinar today, and we appreciate you being here. Um, I'm Jamie Vaughn. I work for Child Unlimited, and I'm the Great Lakes Engagement Coordinator. So um, we are going to hear a presentation today um, by Jake Lemon, and um, we're going to talk about the White River Watershed. But first, I will hand it over to Lance Climey of our awesome local TU chapter, uh, Shrems, West Michigan. Hello, I'm Lance Climey. I'm from the Board of Directors of Shrems, West Michigan, Toronto Limited. Uh, happy to be here tonight to give you an update on what's going on in the White River. Uh, this is a project that has been going for some time, actually. Uh, I have to give a shout out to Mark Hying and Charles Chandler, who are residents of White Cloud, who started it quite a few years ago, clearing the river for kayakers. And that went to engaging Shrems to try and get some more work done. And personally, I've actually started fishing in the White River in 1961. So I have a little bit of a track record with it. Um, but we have a couple things coming up. If you really want to get, inv get involved in the White, this will be a good program to start tonight. But a couple of dates to put down. We have some stream cleanups that we have scheduled for this year. We have not publicized this, this yet. But the Vita Weaver Park in Hesperia on May 14th, which is a Saturday, we'll have a stream cleanup day there. And then on September 24th, we're actually planning a stream cleanup that's going to have spots you can work volunteer at all the way from White Hall to White Cloud. So it's going to be a pretty extensive uh, day and we'll have more updates coming for you. So we'll capture your email address tonight so we can keep you updated on all this progress as well. Um, but right now I want to introduce Jake Lemon. Jake is the Monitoring and Community Science Manager for Trout Limited. And Jake, take it away. Thanks. Thanks, Lance, and thanks, Jamie. Um, Jamie, chime in here if, it may, if there's anything else, but just so folks know, I think you all are muted, at, but there is a chat function, and feel free to enter your questions into the chat box, and we'll probably just go through the, the presentation and then answer questions um, at the conclusion, so uh, that's where you can ask questions. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and kick it off. Um, so hey, everybody, my name is Jake Lemon. I think I know some of you out there, some of you I don't. Um, I'm TU's Monitoring and Community Science Manager based in, in Rockford, Michigan. I've worked for TU for about 10 years and relocated to Michigan in 2018. Um, so when I, when I came uh, to Michigan, uh, I was kind of hearing some, you know, just talk of the white and within TU and how it was an area that could use some increased focus um, for cold water conservation. And so you know, I started directing some of my um, partnership grants with, you know, the Forest Service and others to start learning more about the white and just getting to know folks uh, who are doing great work in the white, um, you know, and learning from the, you know, that history and that uh, knowledge of, of, of conservation and the White River fishery and the watershed as a whole, you know, groups like the Shrimps uh, West Michigan chapter, the White River Watershed Partnership, uh, the kayaking uh, group. Uh, Nicole DeMall, who's my, my supervisor and also wrote the White River Watershed Management Plan in a prior job, and just working towards, you know, just a better understanding of, of what's going on in the watershed. And so um, that's kind of, uh, I guess, springboarded into a more robust uh, effort within the watershed. We've got a lot of stuff going on. And so today I'm just going to talk through kind of our past work, our um, our work that's sort of in progress and then some plans for the future. And so really all of this, um, all of these efforts that we've been facilitating, is just trying to work towards having a better understanding and foundation of information for dat data-driven strategies and to develop partnerships to implement good conservation work in the watershed. So slide. I suspect many of you um, are familiar with the watershed, but for anyone who isn't, um, it's it's a Lake Michigan drainage in, in West Michigan, basically between the, the PM and the Muskegon uh, and Oceana and the Wago and Muskegon County. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a watershed, if you go to this next slide, that um, has, you know, some varied fisheries. So this map you're seeing here is um, some temperature data that we've collected in the watershed. So at, at a very basic level, blue is like prime cold water temperatures for fish, green is good, yellow is kind of edging towards marginal, and red is, you know, not great temperatures for cold water fish. And so you see we have some headwater sections in the upper south branch here, 
super cold uh, water. Um, you know, it's very groundwater driven there. Uh, great wild and naturally reproducing brown and, and, and brook trout populations. Um, and then as you move downstream, you enter the town of White Cloud where there's a dam uh, that significantly warms the stream. Uh, you know, we've, it's been measured a few different times, but roughly about eight degrees Fahrenheit warming below the dam versus above the dam, which turns it into, you know, a little bit more of a marginal um, um, cold water fishery in this middle section. Uh, one that is is where they the DNR plants something like, I think I heard 40,000 fish or some brown trout uh, to support the fishery there. Um, that number could be off. but um, And then you have a number of, of drainages. You know, we have Martin Creek and Mina Creek, which some of you might know, um, that are, you know, cold that are coming into the South Branch area. So um, there are, there is some natural reproduction in this area. There is, a, you know, a fish, a, a stocking supporting fishery in this area and then wild fish and, and most, you know, so, to some degree in the main branch and also in the tributaries. So once you hit Hesperia, there's another dam and this is this dam uh, blocks the, the lake run fish, you know, salmon and, and steelhead. Um, and so you have a, a, a nice steelhead and salmon fishery downstream of Hesperia and then the tributaries here um, that are for the most part pretty cold. And then we have the North Branch, which is, you know, really great cold temperatures, good habitat in a lot of the sections, you know, sort of anecdotally. We have good wild brown trout populations. You have steelhead and salmon moving up into there and then brook trout as well. And so, um, and then you move down here into White Lake, which is, you know, is more of a, a drowned river mouth uh, of fishery. So it's a, it's a really interesting watershed, one that has, you know, varied land uses. We have national forests, we have farming, um, you know, we have private forest lands, we have towns. Um, and so there, it's, a, there's, it's got a lot going for it. And there's also, you know, a lot of opportunity, I think, for, for significant improvement in the watershed. So next, I'm just going to kind of jump into some of the monitoring and assessment work that we've kind of, that we kicked off just to start learning more about the watershed. So the first thing I ever did here, um, personally, I mean, TU has had work in that watershed in the past, but the first thing I personally led was a survey using our Rivers app. So this is basically a smartphone enabled form uh, for uploading geolocated photos of, of habitat issues or, or water quality issues, stream disturbances. You can see some of the categories here on the left. And so we, uh, I think in 2019, uh, worked with the White River Watershed Partnership and SHREMS and some other partners to pull together some volunteers to just walk and float the river, take pictures of what they see, document issues. Um, you'll, you know, you see these yellow um, dots. These are areas with like lacking riparian vegetation, for example. And so it was a great opportunity to just get a sense of what's going on in that watershed, what some of the needs are, and also get to know people who care about the watershed. I think we had 25 or 30 volunteers that helped out with that survey. And I'll talk later a little bit more about how we're using that, that data. Um, I also have a partnership with the Forest Service where we do a pretty extensive temperature monitoring throughout the National Forest. And that's you know, what enabled us to collect that, that watershed-wide temperature data that I showed in a previous slide. We've also been using an environmental DNA to document species distribution in some different watersheds. And so basically, eDNA is just a method of you basically filter stream water, you filter out all the suspended material in stream water and then use uh, genetic tools to find markers of particular species. So basically what it enables you to do is go out to a site, you know, filter some water through it, through this little uh, paper filter, send it into a lab, and they'll tell you what species, you know, species of interest that you, that you ask them to analyze for. They'll tell you if they're in that section of the stream. Um, so we had those analyzed for brook trout, brown trout, and rainbow trout. And you'll see here at the top left is our brook trout, and you'll see they are pretty much everywhere um, side of one small tributary. Same with brown trout, pretty much everywhere aside from one small tributary. And then rainbow trout, you know, as we suspected, were more prolific down below the, the dam. Um, we did have some uh, hits for rainbow trout, and I've heard rumors of some of potentially some wild rainbow populations that sustain sort of here in the, in the middle watershed. Um, so this was done in November of 2020. There was some question, you know, we did have a lot of these brook trout and brown trout hits in areas that are, are, that are warmer. Um, and so there was some question of, well, are they using that seasonally? And so we went back and last summer 
and sampled some of these areas for brook trout um, in July. And we still got positive hits. And so, you know, that could be indicative of, of smaller patches of cold water refuge areas that support small populations of brook trout. They have, haven't really seen those in fisheries data that DNR has collected in those areas, but there are apparently some, some, some amount of brook trout that are, that are surviving in, in some of those warmer middle reaches, which was interesting. Uh, so we also support uh, White River Watershed Partnership and the and and others in the mix, uh, deployment and maintenance of real time monitoring stations. So think of these as like a, basically a USGS station that's sort of scaled down, lower cost. Um, the data and I should have put a link in here is hosted on mon monitormywatershed.org, and basically these are solar powered um, monitoring stations that collect water temperature, water depth, and electrical conductivity. We currently have two in the watershed, one on the north branch and one on the south branch, and there's plans to deploy a few more. Um, these are great tools for our monitoring and research and also for recreationists who, who, uh, who, who spend some time in the watershed to have access to real-time um, data on temperatures and flows. So you know, basically it takes a measurement, uploads it through the cellular network, and folks can see what the temperature is you know, five minutes ago at that particular site. There's also a USGS gauge on the lower river that, that measures uh, discharge. So continuing with our, our sort of monitoring and inventory work, uh, last summer we did an, a road stream crossing inventory of the upper south branch of the white. And you know, many of you might be familiar with this, but TU does a lot of aquatic organism passage work. So basically this is identifying where there are barriers to fish passage that may um, not enable fish to reach cold water refuge or reach areas with a good forage base or just move through the system and share genetic, um, you know, their genetics and, and, you know, having access to large interconnected um, uh, patches of habitat is really important for the health and the um, <clears throat> resiliency of, of these populations to things like climate change and, um, you know, other habitat disturbances. And so we, there was some inventory work that had been done uh, back in, I think 2016 by the uh, White River Watershed Partnership and some done by the Muskegon Conservation District. And we looked at that pretty heavily um, early on and used that as sort of a, to inform where we prioritize as well as to do our road stream crossing inventories, as well as just trying to focus on some of the highest quality habitat in the watershed. And so here you see these point maps of all the barriers we assessed. I think there was something like 35 last summer. Red is a basically a full barrier to fish passage. These are usually like uh, perched culverts or um, sometimes culverts that have water rushing through them so fast that you know fish can't move through them in an upstream fashion. We have barriers at high flows. So that's the yellow one, yellow one. Barriers at most flows, um, not a barrier. And so we're just in the early stages of like of digesting this this information and working with um, the Muskegon or the Nuego Road Commission. Uh, the Forest Service and, and other partners and just trying, started to prioritize where we might focus efforts. You know, one that jumped out here is Flinton Creek, which is a cold tributary to the South Branch where we did have some uh, full barriers and some, some uh, barriers at most flows here. And so it's pretty, pretty chopped up as far as fish passage goes. It might be a good opportunity for sort of a small watershed wide focus area on aquatic organism passage. So, but, you know, those decisions that remain, to, you know, haven't been made yet, and it's, we're still at a point of sort of like digesting this data. Um, we also have, we have plans to expand upon this pretty, pretty dramatically in the, in the coming uh, summer season. We're going to focus uh, based on trying to do a full scale road stream crossing inventory of the North Branch of the White, um, and then probably some of the tr other tributaries to this, to the South Branch. Uh, we'll, we'll be working, you know, we'll have our staff out there. We'll, I think we'll be working with um, the White River Watershed Partnership and Muskegon Community College to have some students out um, doing some of these assessments. The Forest Service is going to be chipping in with some assessments as well. And so, um, you know, it's just about kind of getting the lay of the land, identifying where the needs are and identifying the potential opportunities that, as you know, in regards to aquatic organism passage. And so, That'll be sort of a focus of ours um, in the future. And so as we're collecting this data, we'll start to look into, again, again identifying priorities and then fundraising to support those projects. Um, 
in conjunction with all this data collection, we did uh, a pretty pretty intensive search of all the existing da data um, that was out there in, in the watershed relevant to the work we're doing. Things like macroinvertebrate assessments, you know, habitat assessments, um, things, and you know, the data that we've collected on temperature, things of that like that and brought this all together into a sort of decision support application that visualizes this information and makes it easy to share. So this is something that, you know, when we're talking about where we might, where there might be project opportunities with partners and things like that, this is sort of a central tool that brings all this information together into one place that we can sort of navigate around and look at characteristics of, of particular parts of the watersheds and think, you know, different types of information that has been collected. And so, uh, this is hosted on ArcGIS online. It is publicly available. Again, probably another opportunity where I could have put a link in there, but um, I could probably share that in the, in the chat at some point. So, um, you know, this was this was um, done. Most of this work with the road stream crossing inventories, you know, the temperature monitoring, the eDNA. Most of that was done uh, with support from the U.S. Forest Service. Um, and in, a, in partnership with the U.S. Forest Service, so that's they've been a really critical partner of ours in the um, in the White River watershed. So, alongside of all all this work, uh, you know, collecting data, getting the lay of the land, trying to you know create a foundation of information so that we can develop data driven strategies for cold water conservation. We've also been um, working hard at, at just connecting with partners in the watershed and um, make, you know, building uh, collaboration around uh, re restoration and protection and, you know, watershed, watershed related work in the White River. Um, with support from the Fremont Area Community Foundation, we uh, basically work to develop and convene a stakeholder group called the White River Watershed Collaborative. So this is basically a group of over 45 organizations that have a stake in the White River. They vary from, you know, groups like TU and the White River Watershed Partnership uh, to local municipalities like um, White Cloud and Hesperia and, um, you know, Whitehall uh, to conservation districts, um, state agencies like DNR and Eagle, federal agencies like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and um, Forest Service and NRCS to, you um, you know, economic development interests like the, um, the Hesperia Chamber of Commerce and uh, the right place. And so there, it's a pretty, um, I think a pretty robust and a group that's still continuing to grow. We're still finding people that we need to connect with and loop into this, this effort. And it was, you know, a really nice sort of varied perspectives on the white. Um, and it, we convened uh, a consensus workshop, I guess uh, just over a year ago now, uh, with support from the Fremont Area Community Foundation, where we brought all these folks together to basically do some um, facilitated uh, brainstorming of priorities. And it's sort of centered around this question of what should we focus on in the right White River in the next three to five years? Um, and so we got some really good um, information out of that that's helped driven our, our approaches um, that we'll talk about here. And it's really been a great way to facilitate partnerships and share information, and it's you know already starting to bear fruit as far as fostering collaborative um, projects around the, around the watershed. So, uh, two kind of focus areas preliminary at, at the outset seem to be sort of this you know research and monitoring to help us better understand the needs of the watershed, as well as better understanding and. Um, I guess understanding and leveraging the watershed as an economic resource for the local communities. You know that was something that was of great interest to a lot of the, a lot of the groups in in the watershed. So we've developed two subcommittees that are really starting to dive into more of the nitty gritty of like you know action items for this group. We have our research and monitoring sub subcommittee and our uh, economic opportunity subcommittee. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what each of those groups have been doing. So the research and monitoring subcommittee, it includes um, TU, the White River Watershed Partnership, DNR, the U.S. Forest Service, some uh, riparian landowners along the river, the West Michigan Environmental Action Committee. And what we've really uh, focused on in that group initially is just a gap analysis of the data that we have in the river. So we, 
we're just looking at what information we have and what information we need to make good data-driven strategies for the work that we're doing. And so um, this analysis has some sort of preliminary outcomes. One is the need for more roadstream crossing inventory, which we're getting at, which I've already talked about and we're getting at this summer. There's not a ton of information on habitat conditions. Um, so, you know, wood in the stream, you know, stream substrate, you know, the things that we that are useful in, in understanding where we where we need to do habitat restoration in the areas we should prioritize. And so we'll be starting the process of filling some of those data gaps this summer, um, doing some habitat mapping with the Michigan Council of TU and some of our staff um, and probably collecting um, maybe some other uh, some additional temperature information and things of that nature. Uh, fish data, I mean, there's a lot of historical fish data in the watershed, but a lot of it is from, you know, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. There's not a ton of new data. Uh, DNR did get out and collect some, um, some good fish data on the South Branch just a couple year or two ago. Um, that's been really useful. And so we're looking to continue that effort by um, doing some fishery surveys on the North Branch. Uh, the DNR is committed to doing that uh, this, this year. And uh, that'll help sort of fill some of our knowledge gap of what, what kind of fish populations we're looking at there because that area hasn't been surveyed in a long, long time. So there'll be that. There's potential, potential that we'll do additional fish surveys in the watershed. But right now, the North Branch is kind of the focus of that and potentially some spawning habitat assess or spawning surveys as well. And then a final one that it's been mentioned is um, some issues with algal blooms and eutrophication in the lower watershed. And so we're, we're still kind of figuring out you know, what we can do uh, to better understand and get at that, that issue. So, um, you know, there's lots of work as far from a monitoring and inventory side of things. And, you know, it's something that we're really focusing on right now. We also have our economic opportunity subcommittee, as I mentioned. So this includes the right place, which is, you know, is a, um, a economic develop, development group. Um, and they have a staffer that focuses on the Wago County, or I believe just in Wago County, that's been really involved in this. Um, TU, the City of White Cloud, White River Watershed Partnership, Asperia Area Chamber of Commerce, the Forest Service, various landowners, and then the Nuevo uh, Parks and Recreation, Nuevo County Parks and Rec. So that group has, uh, they, did, they've done a couple um, things. We've submitted an EPA Recreation Economy for Rural Communities proposal. So basically what this is, is it, it's a proposal to get technical support from the um, EPA and consultants on doing planning um, around revitalizing communities with a recreation economy. You know, what kind of changes can a community make that will better um, enhance the recreation economy for community revitalization? And so if that was awarded, um, basically it would, it would support professional facilitation of uh, focus groups and development of basically a planning document and then assistance with fundraising to implement the plan. And so there were 120 uh, applicants for that or, or semi-finalists. So one of 20 that are semi-finalists and there was just an interview the other day. Um, so we'll be finding out if that was successful or not in the near future. Also, there was a, um, sort of a stated goal within some of our early conversations in that group to look at uh, developing a White River economic impact assessment. So this has been done on the Rogue, it's been done on uh, the Huron River, I'm sure there's others in Michigan, but basically it looks at how the river benefits local communities economically, both through uh, recreation and spending, associated spending, as well as property values. And so that group is working with Grand Valley State University uh, to develop a plan um, to conduct one of those studies and have just started fundraising to, to um, basically fund that work with some local community foundations. So that's something that's, that's in development. Uh, Lance mentioned the, the stream cleanup. So we held, Shrems hosted their first uh, stream cleanup last, I think it was early October. And it was, a, you know, I'd say a big success. We had 30 some volunteers that came out and picked up a ton of trash in the watershed. Uh, people were, it was great to see that kind of energy around the White River. We had local people who were from the area. We had people coming from Grand Rapids and other, other nearby communities. You know, we had anglers, we had students. Um, and it was just a, a really nice opportunity for folks to get together um, and do some good work in the watershed and leave it look better than it, than it was the day before. And so it's awesome that Shrems is looking to scale this up. And I'm like what Lance said, pencil in. I think that 
I don't want to say the wrong date. It's, I think it's May 14th. Yes, May 14th, pencil that in, and then I'm sure you'll hear from Trims or myself about, you know, registering for that opportunity uh, moving forward. So really, really cool project there. Um, so kind of getting into the, the current project uh, side of things, another one that just took place last year is, our, is the Diamond Point Stream Bank restoration. So for those of you who spend time in the white, you might know the Diamond Point Stream Access. Um, the for, this is on Forest Service land. It's managed by the Forest Service. And they reached out to us with some, basically some problems they were having with the de deterioration of that access. There was sort of a retaining wall that was falling apart. And they were wanting to look at sort of a more um, natural approach to restoring that stream bank rather than putting in another retaining wall. And so we helped them design and implement a restoration of, of that bank and that access um, that uses, you know, uh, basically graded the, the um, stream bank back to the original contour and used various um, sort of more, nat more um, natural approaches to uh, enforcing it and, you know, keep in um, leaving it in better shape and a more resilient bank and access point moving forward. And so that was completed. It's still not 100%. I mean, there's still some riparian plantings and things that need to, to occur. And it obviously needs a, a growing season to look good as new, but you'll see a before picture here on the left. And then it's sort of in construction picture here on the right. So alongside of that project, we did a riparian planning last year. So you can see another phase of that pro of that Diamond Point project here. And we had some volunteers that came out and helped us plant, I don't know how many, it, uh, hundreds, if not thousands, you know, I would say thousands of trees, um, a thousand or two probably trees in that restored, that restored area. Um, we are pl probably be doing another planting there just to fill some gaps, a smaller one uh, this spring as well. Uh, we also have our tree army program, which Jamie leads, which is a really awesome program that I think they've planted something like 30, 35,000 trees in West Michigan along rivers and streams in the past few years. And uh, they did a, a nice project in, in, in the White River along uh, Five Mile Creek, I believe, um, and the South Branch. Uh, they had a 40 acre property where they planted 2000 seedlings in an area that was devoid of, of riparian vegetation. And they actually hired work crews for the summer that did most of these plantings. And so that was a really, a really cool project that happened last year. And then we're working on developing some additional riparian plantings that'll be more volunteer based and hope be a good volunteer opportunity for folks to get some hands-on work in the watershed. We have one potential one in development with, uh, and we're having some conversations with MDOT to do one of these on one of their properties. Um, and there's, there's potentially others in the work. And really we're a big part of that is leveraging that rivers assessment to identify where those are needed. And so I see that being something we'll do um, in, in you know, the coming year or so. So keep an eye out for that. Um, we're also starting to get more involved in, in log jam and wood management on the white um, in, in the last year or so. Uh, so we mentioned the kayaker group that's led by um, Charles Chandler and Mark Hying, and I'm sure there's others that have done, put a ton of work in on just, you know, using good, you know, using the you know, good DNR approved practices that you know, maintain wood in the stream and the positive benefits of having, habitat benefits of having wood in the stream while allowing watercraft to pass through these areas safely. And so, you know, they spent, they've had a ton of work opening up the White River for paddling over the past, you know, I don't know how many years, probably five plus years. And we're looking to start to, start to build off of that and, and, and create some, um, some sustainable support for log jam management in the White. So, you know, basically, the way this were, you know, the, the, in the past, a lot of times uh, groups would cut entire trees out of the, out of the river to allow kayaks and you know and drift boats and others to pass. And you know, while that does allow boat passage, it by removing tree, you know, having wood and trees in the stream has huge benefits um, to fish and macroinvertebrate populations, creating habitat. Um, good habitat conditions, good hydrologic and geomorphological complexity in the stream. And it's just, you know, it's good. Basically wood is good in the stream when it comes to fish and bugs. So, you know, there's now, there's approaches to, again, allowing passage of boats while keeping as much of that wood in the stream as possible. And this could be, you know, basically cutting out small sections 
of the log jam or using a grip hoist, which is basically like a come along you see here in this picture to pull log jams basically downstream so that they're still in the water, but then you have passage on that on that opposite bank. And so we did a little bit of this work, um, working on some log jams uh, below, kind of in the Taylor Bridge area last year. Um, and we do a lot of this with the Forest Service. It's a partnership that we have with them. We've done it on the PM for years and years, and then some of it on the Pine. And just I just heard that the Forest Service has elevated the white to their number two priority for this type of work. So I think we'll have more capacity kind of to work on managing some of these log jams in the future, which I think will be some good work. Kind of getting into some future work here. Um, so the Forest Service reached out to us about looking at doing some habitat work on Martin Creek. So this will be um, to some degree doing some of this wood addition, some woody habitat work. So placing basically wood in the stream and the positive benefits you get with that. And, the, and as well as addressing some of the older structures that are in there and you know how those will be addressed will depend structure to structure sort of a situation specific context but you know some of these structures are starting to deteriorate and so we'll be looking to um to work on some of those as well so that's something i don't have a timeline for that it's something that's sort of in the works um and hopefully i'm hopeful that there'll be some volunteer opportunities associated with that so i talked a lot about aquatic organism passage earlier um you know this is something that TU does a ton of uh, you know, throughout the country, really, but, you know, in Michigan as well. Um, and so, you know, we, I've covered most of the stuff, I think, for the Upper South Branch. The one here on the left is on Skeels Creek, and it's a culvert that's been causing some upstream flooding and would be a huge project, but one we've had some discussions about. So, you know, this, this aquatic organism passage work is something that I see us Really beginning to fundraise for in the coming year, and hopefully have some projects to implement in, a, in you know any couple three years uh, in the watershed, and so that'll be something that's building up there. Um, the White Cloud Dam, as I mentioned earlier, and I'm sure many of you are aware that the dam does have a, a significant temperature impact on the river. Um, like I said, it raised according to the last round of monitoring, did it raise temperatures by roughly eight degrees Fahrenheit, uh, transitioning from a really high quality uh, cold water fish fishery upstream to a more marginal one downstream. Um, so, you know, this, this has been, uh, I guess, through the, through, through the uh, White River Watershed Collaborative and some other, some other connections, we, we, the town of White Cloud actually reached out to us asking for just information on the dam, the option of dam removal. And so we provided them with some information, some presentations. We actually developed a little report for them the sort of a preliminary analysis of the dam removal option for the White Cloud Dam. Um, and they took this to their city council um, and actually just had a community forum last night uh, in regards to dam removal. And, you know, the, the, the community, for the most part, um, is very adamant about keeping the dam. They, you know, this all came about because of some bills they had as far as dam repairs that were mandated by Eagle. And the, the city council ended up voting to uh, pay for the current repairs. And so that, you know, the White Cloud Dam potential removal is sort of tabled. It's tabled for now. The community decided, you know, it's really, it's a decision of the dam owner, which is the city of White Cloud. And the community decided that they're going to continue to pay for repairs. And so that's sort of the situation at the moment for the White Cloud Dam. Another small dam that we're looking at in the watershed is the Mini Pond Dam. So this is on Mina Creek. Um, some of you might maybe have camped at the, uh, mini pond uh, campground there. And um, this is an old old dam. It's getting, it's probably, I think 85 years old now, um, started to deteriorate. Um, and then, and the Forest Service reached out to us about, you know, started to do some investigation about the potential for removing this dam. We dug up some, some old temperature data from probably 20 years ago that indicates it is, does have a significant therm impact on stream temperatures on Mina Creek. We plan to deploy more temperature, some temperature loggers this year to, you know, document that, uh, provide some more up-to-date documentation of that potential temperature impact and understand that better. Um, the Forest Service is also going to do a use study just to better understand, you know, how many people are using the campground, how many people are using that impoundment. And um, we'll also be looking at the impoundment itself to understand kind of where it is in its life. So basically as as, as impoundments age, they fill in with sediment. 
And, you know, every, every dam basically has a life cycle where you get to a point where you either have to remove the dam or dredge the pond to remove all the sediment. And so what we're going to be doing a set, basically a survey of, street of, of depths in the, that impoundment to understand kind of what, how much set, how much sedimented it in it is and how much longer of a life it's likely to have um, before it is fully sedimented in. So that's, that's something that's like, you know, sort of in conversations in the works. It's not a done deal by any means, but we're just collecting information to inform it moving forward. So I think that's all I had. Yeah, that's all I have. Um, so we had a lot going on in that watershed. We have some really great, great partners. And, you know, I, I want to call out White River Watershed Partnership, Shrimp West Michigan TU, and the, and, um, the kayaking group and the other folks who have been so great and just like sharing information and helping me understand what's going on in that watershed. It's been a big learning curve over the past three years. And I think we're really positioning ourselves well with, with the right data, the right partnerships to identify good projects in that watershed and, and, and make, make a difference. So um, I think with that, we could probably do some questions. Jamie, do you, do you wanna facilitate that? Yeah, thank you so much, Jake. So it looks like we have a question already in the chat, but uh, feel free to send those in um, via the Q&A function or put them in the chat and we'll get those addressed. Um, this first one is regarding um, your eDNA study and the brook trout um, uh, DNA that appeared in warmer stretches. Could that be a result of drifting down from colder stretches or does that indicate that brook trout are present there? That's a really good question and one that we, we wrestled with a little bit. I mean, it we there's definitely the potential that tributary it could drip down from tributaries basically and we chose sites that were as far away as possible from any tributary the the this we work with the u.s forest uh, natural genomics lab on this work and their guidance generally is that if you have a a population of fish about what they have to be within about one kilometer of your sample for you to get a hit or they become too diluted, that DNA becomes too diluted to really, um, to really show up through eDNA. And so we set all those sites except for, no, actually I think all of those sites were more than a kilometer downstream of a cold tributary. Um, and so, you know, it's it's not 100% resolved, but to the best of information we have, you know, in the approach we made, we think, my, my guess is that there's probably some springs or groundwater seeps that are supporting sections of, of cold stream, or maybe some really small sort of unmapped tribs that might be supporting some of these populations. So, you know, we you, you can kind of take, it's sort of a soft takeaway of, of you know, our, our brook trout using these sections. And until we actually get in and find them with electrofishing, data. Um, we won't know 100% certain, but there's some early indications that. Hey, if I can add to that. Case. Case. Sure. Um, we actually did a, a live tracking of brook trout on a study through uh, Grand Valley and Cedar Creek. And we, tr so we real time tracked the location of these fish over a two year period. It was pretty amazing how the brook trout will find the cold water seeps. And there, in a lot of times, that's why groundwater is so important streams because you'll find places where really cold water is coming up, but you don't expect it there at all. But the brook trout know it's there and they will find it and stay there during the warm parts of the summer. Yep, absolutely. All right, we got another uh, great question from Mike Small again. What are the maintenance costs on the White Cloud Dam? Um, you know, those vary, you know, it depends on each inspection, basically, they, the Eagle Dam Safety provides a list of required, you know, if there, if there are deficiencies, they provide a, a list of required um, repairs, and then the White Cloud engineer comes up with a, a cost estimate for those. So, you know, there was an inspection back in 2019. Um, and I think there was like $140,000 in repairs for that. There'll be another inspection this year uh, as well. And so, you know, it, it vary. I don't know what the, the year to year maintenance probably will vary, I think. Um, you know, I've heard, I've heard roughly 20,000 a year um, on year to year maintenance. But, um, you know, just like a like a used car, as dams age, they require more intensive and more frequent repairs. So I'm sure you know the cost will probably increase over time, but I guess that remains to be seen. 
Thanks, Jake. We've also had a few people ask about um, some of the maps that you shared, um, like the eDNA. Um, are those publicly available or, or something that you can share to the group? Yeah, member? so those, those are in the decision uh, support tool that I mentioned. Um, and I can actually drop a link to that in the chat. All the data that I, that I showed you all is in that mapping application. So I'd be happy to share that. Thank you. Another one on data, um, is there uh, an established channel for anglers to contribute to the data pool? So right now, the way we, I have had some anglers and volunteers contribute to the, um, the sorry, I'm entering this, let me enter this chat, talk and typing at the same time is difficult. <laughs> So, you know, whether from the river study with some of our temperature monitoring, we've had volunteer involvement. And I expect to have more and more opportunities like that in the coming year, in the coming this year and, and moving forward. And right now, what I have is sort of, you know, basically when there's a volunteer opportunity, um, SHRIMS reaches out to their network to, to get, find volunteers. And then I keep a list basically of people who have volunteered in the past or have reached out to me specifically with interest in volunteering that I'll email these opportunities to. So I have a list of like 50 people that we, we get a lot of volunteers from. And so, you know, I think if people are interested in volunteering, if you're, if you're a member of SHRIMS and you get their emails, you'll hear about those opportunities through them. Um, if you're, you know, if you're from a different area, maybe a different chapter or not a TU member, probably the best way is to reach out to me and get on that email list that I keep. And you can see my email here on the slide. So feel free to reach out to me and I can add you to that, to that list. So I do anticipate having some op more opportunities in the future uh, for volunteers, you know, community science uh, and data collection. Thanks, Jake. We've got another good question from Dave. Um, could you explain the different type of barriers that you showed earlier in the presentation? The different types of barriers? Yes. Okay. Um, so most of, most of the barriers in that map um, that I showed are, are just road stream crossings. So they're basically, they're culverts. Um, you know, it's basically where a road crosses a stream, there's a, cul there's a culvert. Some of them pass fish, or some of them may be bridges as well, and they pass fish. But usually the barriers are some sort of, of, of culvert. I think I have a picture of one of them earlier in the slides here. Yeah, so that's an example. We have like sort of a triple culvert. Um, you know, I think the downstream, this is the upstream end, the downstream is basically perched above the stream level. So there's like a little waterfall of water pouring out of that culvert. So there's basically very little chance, except that very high flows, that fish can actually get through that culvert to access the upstream section. So that's mostly what it is. And we do a ton of work, again, working with county road commissions to get grant funding to replace these and often, you know, putting in, you know, Different, there's different kinds of structures you can put in that allow fish passage. And they're also an added benefit is they're more flood resilient. So these structures that we put in that add fish passage, they're much less likely to get blown out um, during large storm events. They have less maintenance costs for local road commissions. Um, and, you know, they, 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 they are less, they, they, they do not um, cause upstream flooding like some of these, some of these do. And so, you know, road commissions love tend to love this work. We work a lot with the New Wago Road Commissions and some New Wago Road Commission and other watersheds like Bigelow Creek. We've had a couple um, guests ask about um, your engagement with private landowners and if there's it had if there has been any engagement with them so far, um, what that might look like, and um, what impact does the natural river status of the White um, River have on management as well. So we do have some private landowners that we've connected with um, both on sort of a project level, like we have opportunities to, you know, for projects on specific parcels and we've connected with those landowners. We do have uh, some landowners who are actually on the White River Watershed Collaborative as well. Um, and, you know, I, I want to connect more, you know, we've, We've done some, I think, some decent outreach connecting with landowners, but there's so much more of that that we could do. And I think that'll be a process that will kind of roll out in the coming years and, you know, have more opportunities. I think the riparian plantings is one great opportunity to work with, with landowners um, along the river. And, I, you know, I think there'll be more too. Um, so there's been like some work there, but there's more work to be done. Um, as far as the natural river status, you know, it's it does... Um, 
you know, base, you know, basically there's a, there's, it's designated as a natural rover by DNR. So there's a, basically a permitting uh, process for any development, you know, within however many hundred feet, I think it's two, maybe two or 300 feet of, of the, of the river. Um, and so it, it, it limits riverside development. You know, I haven't worked a ton with that other than getting permits myself for work that we've done in the watershed. Um, but it, you know, it does, you know, it does result in a more uh, natural setting uh, for folks who are recreating and paddling on, on, the, on the river. Thanks. And Lance made a great point in the chat that um, this kind of uh, resurgence to focus on the White River was really started by a group of landowners who are really passionate about it. So there are certainly um, so many people within the watershed and on the river that, that care deeply. That's a great point. And we you know we have landowners who are also donors to our to our work. And so we have some really good land over landowner partners in the watershed. All right, I got another couple of questions on the dam. I might try to um, mix into one. Um, what would it cost to remove the white cloud dam? And what do you think is kind of keeping the community from um, embracing that as a kind of a sentimentality of its, you know, historicness and, and its presence in the community for so long? Um, and, and if at all, what do you think might might move them in that direction for its removal? Um, so cost remove the dam, I, I don't know. Um, the, that would come out if they were actually did a full feasibility analysis of, for dam removal uh, with like an engineering firm, then you would get an actual cost estimate for dam removal. I'm sure if you ask someone who was a dam removal expert, they could give you a range, um, but I don't, I don't have that off the top of my head. Um, Let's see, the second part was what's what's keeping them from embracing that as an option. So, you know, it's it's um there's a few, there's several factors. You know, one is that that dam has been there since I think 1879 in various iterations. And so, you know, it's a fixture in the community. That pond is a fixture in the community. Folks have lived there their entire life and it's always been there. And so there's a you know a certain um emotional attachment and nostalgia for that feature in their community. Um, it's also, you know, the, the whole pond is ringed by landowners. There's like 32 part landowners around the pond and they currently own land on a pond. And so it's a, it's a big leap sort of mentally to understand, you know, how that might affect them to own land on a river instead. Um, and, you know, how that could affect property values and also just their, how they enjoy that, that area. Um, and then there's a there's also a, a swimming area in the pond that gets a lot of use. Um, the you know a lot of the upper part of the pond is pretty sedimented in. You know it's only a few feet deep, but the lower part of the pond is still pretty deep. And they have a little beach there, and it gets a lot of use. They have free swimming lessons every year for all the kids in the community. There's a a fishing derby uh, event that drew like 500 people last year, and so they see it as sort of a central um, part of their sort of aspect and defining feature of their of their community. And so there's a lot of they have a love for the dam. And they, you know, it's a priority for a lot of people to, to in the community to keep it. Um, what can move that? You know, it'll, it, 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 it's that's not it's hard for me to say. I mean, it's it could come down to economics um, and just, you know, if the town can afford to continue maintaining and repairing the dam. That's, you know, that's probably what it, what it comes down to. And they'll have to continually reassess, reassess that as, as bills come down for repairs and, you know, whether that's something they can pay for, or if they may have to do other fundraising or taxes to raise, raise those funds. Thanks, Jake. We got another question from Tom Workman. Has there been any discussion about establishing fishing zones um, on the white, like there's been on the PM, like flies only sections, no kill sections, things like that? I haven't really gotten into that um, side of things at this point. Um, you know, if the DNR proposed something like that, I'm sure we would comment on it and provide our input, um, but that's not really something I've looked at. Another damn question. Is there um, a potential design that could bypass the pond um, to have a portion um, of the water uh, bypassing that to re reduce the thermal impact? You know, there, that's a question that's come up in the past. And um, the best answer that I've gotten from people who know a lot more about this stuff than I do about um, is that you could probably retain a small pond, uh, but it would be way smaller than the current, you know, I think it's like maybe 40 acres. I don't know off the top of my head 
but it'd be much smaller than the current pond, but you could probably retain some a small pond. Okay, I think we got to all the questions. Um, if you have any last uh, questions, feel free to um, throw them in the chat and we'll get to those. Um, if not, somebody did ask if this uh, will be shared and we did record this presentation, so we'll be sure to share it out on our Facebook page, the Channel Limited's Great Lakes Program. I'm sure Sean as well gladly share that out as well. Um, so please do look for that if you wanna re reference any of the great information that Jake shared throughout the presentation. Um, please go ahead and uh, take a look um, for that when we send that out. Um, um, I don't see any other questions coming in, but um, I'm really, really uh, so happy that so many of you took the time out of uh, this beautiful day to come and, and listen to uh, what's going on in the watershed. And I'll hand it uh, to you, Jake, for any closing thoughts. Yeah, um, I just appreciate you coming out, to, you know, spending time with us tonight. I know it's a, a nice weather out there. And, uh, and so I appreciate you taking the time to hear about what we're working on. And so we're looking for more uh, commuter and supporters, you know, more, more community and supporters in the watershed. So, um, you know, reach out to me if you have an interest in getting involved and we'll go from there. All right, Lance, any closing thoughts from Shrems? No, we just, oh, there's just so much potential in this river. I mean, if you think about it, this is not, uh, this is an economically distressed area. If you think about what the Pier Marquette has meant to that local community, I think the white has the capability of doing the same thing for Hesperia and for White Club. So there's a lot of potential there. And that's why there's a lot of focus being paid on the economic end of this. And that is, it again, is being led by Julie Burrell of the right place in Grand Rapids. Uh, she is assigned specifically to Nuevo County. All right, thank you guys all so much and uh, keep a lookout for this presentation to be shared later on and, and uh, for the upcoming White River cleanups and more opportunities um, to get involved in what's going on and, and this awesome movement on a really uh, fantastic watershed. So thanks all so much for being wonderful advocates for the river and I um, hope you enjoy some great fishing this spring. Take care. Thanks everybody.